My name is Ashton Cox, and then I am doing a book review on the Master Plan for Evangelism by Robert E. Coleman. Dr. Robert E. Coleman is widely known for his ministry as a disciple maker and evangelist around parts of the world. He is known to be a speaker at various events, teaching on topics such as theology of evangelism, the theory and practice of evangelism, and the theory and practice of evangelism in the Great Commission. Dr. Coleman has taught at Gordon-Conwell South Hamilton since 2001. After directing the School of World Mission and Evangelism at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School for 18 years, he currently serves on the Mission America Facilitation Committee and several international mission boards and is the president of Christian Outreach. Dr. Coleman has written several books, and he is best known for writing the book, Master of Evangelism. Coleman's purpose in writing the Master Plan of Evangelism is to examine the evangelistic strategy and methods that Christ used during his earthly ministry. In this book, believers receive the perfect model and example to a successful ministry of evangelism with Christ being the centerpiece. Robert E. Coleman's book, The Master Plan of Evangelism, gives us a glimpse into Christ's ministry, his teaching, and methods of what it means to be a disciple and a disciple maker for the kingdom. Coleman states, limited as our faculties of perception may be, we know that in the master we have a perfect teacher. He never made a mistake. Though partaking of our life and being tempted in all points as we are, he was not bound by limitations of the flesh, which he accepted for our sake. Even when he chose not to exercise his divine omniscience, his mind was clear. He always knew what was right. And as the perfect man, he lived as God would live among humans. Coleman also points out Christ's objective was clear, stating the days of his flesh were but the unfolding in time of the plan of God from the beginning. It was always before his mind. He intended to save out of the world a people for himself and to build a church of the spirit which would never perish. He had his sights on the day his kingdom would come in glory and in power. This world was by was his by creation, but he did not seek to make it his permanent abiding place. His mansions were in the sky. He was going to prepare a place for his people that had foundations eternal in the heavens. Jesus' ministry points readers to what allowed him to reach his ultimate goal, along with what it takes for, for, for believers to do the same. Coleman states his life was ordered by his objective, Everything he did and said was a part of the whole pattern. It had significance because it contributed to the ultimate purpose of his life in redeeming the world for God. This was the motivating vision governing his behavior. His steps were ordered by it. Mark it well, not for one moment did Jesus lose sight of his goal. Christ's ultimate goal was to make disciples. This would be the avenue that would help people to know and live for the Lord. So how does Coleman's book bring value to the Christian's life and ministry today? Coleman breaks down Jesus's ministry into eight parts, including selection, association, consecration, impartation, demonstration, delegation, supervision, and reproduction. These eight parts can be applied in our lives today. First, selection of Jesus' disciples was his first step for disciple making. He chose what culture would see, would view as social misfits in society to teach them his ways of the kingdom agenda. Jesus kept his group small so he could effectively teach and mold them into his likeness, his character, and so they could have his view on how they should, um, 
or have his view on their outlook of the culture around them. Jesus selected a few so in turn they could take the gospel to the masses after his ascension into heaven. Second, Jesus used association to teach his disciples that believers are to have an intimate relationship with the Father. Jesus was also giving them a model of what it meant to make disciples. In order to make disciples, one must be attentive to the person's needs. Along with partaking in life's experiences and teaching the gospel effectively to the hearers. Jesus teaches believers that they must be relational beings. Third, Jesus taught his disciples consecration, which meant to count the cost when it comes to being or count the cost when it comes to following his lordship. A disciple of Christ must go to desperate lengths to follow Jesus, putting away sin and any worldly distractions that do not benefit the kingdom. Romans 12, 1 through 2 states, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing perfect will. Jesus gave his love, time, and devotion, and even physically laying down his life for the sins of humanity. Jesus did this in turn to point his disciples to what it meant to sacrificially serve for his cause. 1 John 3.16, stating, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Fourth, Jesus used impartation and demonstration to teach his disciples what it meant to give wisdom and demonstrate it through their actions. Jesus taught the disciples through sharing his knowledge of scriptures and his outlook on life from God's perspective. Jesus also demonstrated what it meant to be a disciple through showing the disciples his actions through prayer, fasting, a long time with the Father, and dealings with society. Jesus not only taught his disciples, but let them be a part of hands-on ministry. Jesus even allowed his disciples to see the mighty miracles he performed throughout his ministry. One of the moments in the scriptures where Jesus' deity was on full display was when he calmed the storm in Mark 4, 35-41. Jesus allowed his disciples to see firsthand who he was as Messiah and Lord. So we see countless times through his ministry, he invited his disciples onto ministry journeys so they could see who he was. And to see that after he ascended, he would send the Holy Spirit and they would be able to perform the same miracles through his power. Him being the source of the miracle and him being the source of the fruit that they bared and being the source of being a disciple of Christ. Fifth, delegation and supervisions was two, supervision was two strategies Jesus used for his evangelistic methods. As Jesus began seeing growth in the matur and maturity in the disciples, he would delegate various roles for them to serve in. Jesus would check up on the disciples and provide feedback if they needed to work on areas of their ministry. Jesus never left his disciples um, through their ministry. While he served on earth with them, he was there to provide feedback, to walk along with them, and to provide wisdom when it was needed. Lastly, one of Jesus' final strategies to evangelism was encouraging his disciples to mirror his example in making disciples for the kingdom. So in turn, to be a disciple, you in turn make disciples from that. So Jesus was painting a picture of what it meant to not only be a disciple, but to be a disciple maker. We read in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. Jesus' strategy and example gives disciples and readers the perfect example of what it means to be an effective evangelical. Thank you.